Dr. Peter Shumlin. Thank you, Kiki. And it's so great to have you join this webinar on Oxford Academia. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the ground rules and, and how we're going to proceed. We're not going to keep you too long, but we will uh, mostly Professor Basper and uh, two of our featured guests today, who are one's an amazing teacher that's been with us for a long time, the other uh, is an assistant dean, are going to talk a little bit about the program at Oxford University. And then we will and we'll show you some slides to sort of give you a little background. And then we're going to answer your questions. So think about questions as you go. And we'll it'll take us about 30 minutes of just talking a little bit. Then we'll go to questions. And then we're all just delighted to answer your individual questions should you have them. And I'll tell you a little bit about my involvement, and then I will click off the screen and come back to questions. We also have Hannah Gilkinson, who's one of the directors of this program, uh, who's able to answer questions with us too. So first, a huge welcome. And uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, what we're up to and why this program is so amazing. I should say that, and you can click the next slide, you'll see that uh, we have three academia programs, Oxford, American University of Paris and University of Siena. We're gonna focus on Oxford today. The programs at American University of Paris and the University of Siena are much smaller. Uh, they are already full. There's a small chance we can squeeze a few more into Siena. So if you're really excited about those, give us a call, we'll tell you about those possibilities. Oxford is a larger program, so we still have some capacity, although it's tight here too. How did we end up at Oxford Academia? Who are, who are we and what's this all about? If you go to the next slide, you'll see that uh, Putney was founded 71 years ago by my parents, uh, our parents. Uh, they were educators uh, who really believed that we should turn summer, summer vacation into education. Remember, that was before commercial air travel. The students used to meet together at the Port of New York, take the ship across. It would take seven or eight or nine days spend eight weeks studying at Oxford or Cambridge or doing service or whatever it was that you're doing and you'd come back at the end of August. So when students now look at two and four week programs, we consider those short compared to the old days. Uh, that's my mom there who's now 91. My dad has passed away, but they had a vision that you could turn summer vacation into education. Uh, they had amazing programs at both Oxford and Cambridge long before Professor Basper or any of the other people on this panel were born. About 35, 37 years ago, Professor Basper founded his own program at Oxford. And it was so good and so superior, frankly, to what we thought that we were doing, that we often referred students to that and we discontinued our sort of general studies program at Oxford and Cambridge. So the obvious question is why? And here's the answer. Uh, Jim got his, his, his BA at Harvard, uh, was a Rhodes Scholar who got both his master's and his PhD at both Cambridge and Oxford, taught there for some time, and is in my view, the most extraordinary, one of the most extraordinary educators I've ever worked with, but also his life passion, and by the way, when he's not in real life today, he is and has been for some time. He taught at Harvard for a while. He now is a professor at both Columbia and Barnard. He heads the Gilman Lehrman American History Institute, which educates uh, thousands of students across the world in history. He's one of the most extraordinary historians I've met. And he also is on the Rhodes Scholar Board and very involved with Rhodes House and all the magic they, that they make happen. His program was so superior because he was able to convince his colleagues from Cambridge and Oxford, and University of London and other places, some of whom you'll meet today, to teach high school students during the summer. So he founded a program that you may have heard of over the years called Oxford Summer Programs and ran that for a number of years. He then transferred that to a larger education organization because he was so busy doing the job he was supposed to do during the year at Columbia Barnard and Gilman Lehrman that he simply couldn't spend the time administering it. And that went quite well for a number of years. That organization then got transferred to a larger venture capital group of some kind. Uh, I won't go into the gory details, except to say that Professor Basco is no longer with Oxbridge Summer Programs. 
And we got together and Putney has had a history in 71 years of partnering with a lot of great educational organizations. We run National Geographic's educational programs for years. We run New York Times student journeys. We currently run Smithsonian's educational programs. We collaborate with both the Harvard School of Public Health and Columbia University on program for them. And we said, Jim, uh, this magic has to continue. And Oxford Academia was born. So I've always said, often said to parents, you know, taking Professor Bass out of Oxbridge or out of an organization is kind of like taking Macbeth out of Macbeth, but he's much cheerier, uh, much more interesting and much better educated. So it's a really exciting for us at Putney after seven years of being sort of leaders in summer education to be collaborating with Professor Basket is the director program. So without further ado, I want to introduce Jim. I just want to say that when I'm not here at Putney, I've served as a governor. I've taught at the Kennedy School of Harvard. I've been a, I'm a fellow at the School of Public Health at Harvard. Jim is by far one of the most exciting educators that I've worked with. And it's why this program is so special at Oxford. So I turn it over to my friend, my colleague, and someone that I, that I admire tremendously, Jim Basper, who will introduce the rest of the characters here. So thanks for hearing me out. I'll be back on during questions and answers. And Jim Basper, take it away. Peter, thank you. Uh, that is always too generous of you. Uh, but I want to add my welcome to yours, to the people who are joining us today. And I want to thank my colleagues, Abby and Predrag, who are on the call with us. You're going to hear from them in a couple of minutes. Uh, so I just want to start by saying that uh, people who can see my image on the screen can see that uh, I have Christchurch in the background, which was the college I lived in as a graduate student at Oxford. And it's a much better thing to look at than my messy studio here in, uh, in New York. Um, as Peter indicated, it's been my passion for many years to bring high school students to Oxford University and to create uh, intellectual and uh, creative uh, opportunities for them, often in subjects that they cannot do in school at home in a magical environment and taking advantage of the extraordinary human resources uh, of Oxford itself and of the UK generally. You're gonna hear from a couple of those people in just a minute. But if we move the slides forward, I'd like to introduce you to Oxford um, for just a minute or two, there is my college, Christchurch, on the left uh, with the tower, Tom Tower, designed by Christopher Wren. That is the front quadrangle of Christchurch, built in the 1500s by first by Cardinal Wolsey and then taken over by Henry VIII. And on the right, you see an image of the ex exterior of the Sheldonian Theater, which was created in the 1660s as a ceremonial theater for Oxford University to do its matriculation and graduation and other ceremonies. There are concerts held there. It's one of the most extraordinary buildings in Europe. Christopher Wren designed it um, at a point where he was still a mathematics and engineering don at Oxford, but took a hand at architecture, imitated a Roman style and built a building that uh, people still marvel at because he was able to create a uniquely suspended ceiling with no columns. Uh, but it's typical of the riches of Oxford, which is made up of 38 residential colleges, each of them autonomous. And if we move forward to the next slide, I think you'll see images of other places. Here is a great view of the Sheldonian uh, from the side view. You can see that Roman shape. And this is a, a typical street in the center of Oxford. Uh, through that arch, you see on the right, the Clarendon building built in the early 1700s, originally housing the Oxford University Press. Today it is uh, classroom space, but also on the ground floor on the right, uh, the Vice Chancellor of Oxford, Louise Richardson, has her office. We're lucky she'll wave out the window at us or come to the opening assembly. Uh, she is the first female Vice Chancellor to run Oxford University in its 800-year history. So Oxford is continuing to make history. The arch that you see is connecting two halves of Hartford College. It's a deliberate imitation of the Bridge of Sighs in Venice although it was built uh, in about 1900, it's still in use today, connecting new halves of the college so they don't have to go outside and there's still clear passage in the medieval street underneath. If we go to the next slide, you see a little bit more of Oxford. Here, one of the uh, beautiful quadrangles, uh, University College, which is one of our residences. And in the background, you can see 
uh, distant hills. Oxford is, sits uh, at the juncture of the Thames River um, and the Charwell in a little bowl of hills, and it's got beautiful rural districts all around the outskirts. And during the course of the program, we'll probably take kids on some historic walks into those places. Um, if we go to the next slide, we'll see some more of Oxford, I think. Yes, some scenes from within University College there, a chalk greeting on the sidewalk. University College was founded in the 1200s, in about 1249, according to tradition. So it's the oldest of the three colleges that we're going to be part of and the, claims to be the oldest in Oxford itself. On the right is a memorial to its star student, Percy Bysshe Shelley, who uh, was actually expelled from Oxford for an irreverent uh, pamphlet that he wrote. Later, one of the most famous of the Romantic poets, he was in Italy when in a sailing accident, he drowned and his body washed up on the shore. And so that sculpture, represents a beautiful languid pose of his body as it lay on the beach in Italy. And then lines from some of his poems in honor of Keats are around the memorial at the top. This is one of the most beautiful poetic memorials anywhere. But it's typical of how each of the colleges has its own treasures, its own architectural splendor, its own histories, often its own paintings, um, its own library and courtyards and so on so that each is its own special community. And we live in three of the most interesting Oxford colleges, University, Worcester College, and St. Anthony's College, which Abby's gonna tell us more about in a minute. If we move forward for a second, um, this is the other end of Oxford. It continues to grow and add modern buildings. This is uh, an architectural splendor that opened just two years ago. The Blavatnik School of Government, funded by a very wealthy uh, donor, and it houses uh, various of the programs in government and international relations at Oxford. Um, we may actually go to a lecture or two in this building, which is not very far from uh, St. Anthony's College, and I know a lot of the St. Anthony's faculty and students use it. Um, it sits on an ancient site, but it is spectacular modern architecture. And Oxford is a mixture of all of these different styles, spanning from the time it was a royal capital and a seat that uh, kings of England lived in, um, founded first by the Normans in 1071. And uh, still to this day, it has a castle, the remnants of a castle there, and is thought of historically as a royal seat. If we move to the next image, um, now we can talk about the courses. While we're looking uh, on the left, at the Duke Humphreys Library within the Bodleian. The Bodleian Library is the uh, centerpiece of Oxford's library system. You can see it's a beautiful medieval building and that section of the library has only manuscripts and the rarest of printed books. Groups of our students will get private tours of the Bodleian during the summer. On the right, you can see the curriculum. So every student chooses a major and a minor course. As I mentioned, the courses are often subjects kids can't do in high school, including medicine, about which you'll hear in a minute, law and society, um, psychology and artificial intelligence, archaeology and anthropology, business banking and markets, and so on. Every student does one course as a major, which will meet for three hours or three and a half hours in the morning, six mornings a week. And then they choose any other subject that they wish as a minor. So you could major in creative writing and minor in medicine or major in medicine and minor in international relations, absolutely any two courses that a student cares about become their unique um, curriculum or program, their personal program for the summer. If we move to the next slide, here uh, is where I'd really like to spend some time talking about the stars of this group um, and to turn to my colleagues. Uh, the people you see on the screen here are some of the most imaginative teachers in the world. They're all stars. They have star transcripts or resumes, as you might say, but and masters of their subject. But above all, these are people who are passionate about their fields, and they're imaginative and hands-on in the way that they teach them. So uh, having said that, I'd like to turn to my two colleagues at the moment. And I'll start with Abby Godoy, who will introduce herself. She's a Rhodes Scholar living in Oxford, who's going to be a junior dean this summer based at St. Anthony's. Abby, would you tell us a little bit about your own 
career in Oxford and a little bit about St. Anthony's too. Hi guys, thanks for joining and thank you, Jim. As Jim mentioned, I am a Rhodes Scholar and I am from Belize, which makes me the Caribbean Rhodes Scholar. Um, I've been at Oxford for almost two years. I'm about to complete the master's in social anthropology. I focus on Belize and Nigeria and kind of youth activism in the two nations during COVID-19. Um, I'm also a very proud Antonian, so I'm super excited to have you guys come to my college. My college has one of the most unique architectures in the entire Oxford. It's won awards for having the best brutalist structure in England, I think, um, if I'm remembering that detail right. Um, it's a very international college. I think we house mostly um, master's students who are doing area studies, which means that we have the Japanese library, we have the Latin American studies library. Um, we also have a lot of people in di diplomatic studies and international relations, Eastern European studies. So at any point in time, there's people from everywhere in St. Anthony's. We have really cool language immersion nights, which if they're happening during the summer, I'd be happy to take some of the kids to. Um, yeah, everything is very walkable. We're in North Oxford, which puts us very near to Port Meadow, to a lot of cool cafes. And I'm just kind of really excited to have everyone come and enjoy St. Anthony's life and what it means to be an Antonian. And yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> Abby, thank you. And Abby uh, is going to be a junior dean, like as you can see on the screen, Sammy Ginsburg, who's been with our program in past years as a teacher in Connecticut and will be like Abby, part of the uh, pastoral care team who look after student life, uh, help kids uh, do walking tours and get to know the institutions and cultural offerings of Oxford and then oversee residential life and make sure everybody's happy and healthy. Now, representing one of our uh, star academic subjects is Predrag, who uh, I'm, I, I'm just so impressed that he took time to do this. Predrag is a senior member of the faculty at the medical school at St. Andrews University in Scotland. He's been teaching on programs in Oxford with me, uh, I think we're saying at least 10 years or so, Predrag. And thank you for joining us. Would you say a few words about how you approach teaching kids medicine who may never have experienced it before in Oxford. Thank you, Jim, for introduction. So, hello everyone, I'm Fred Rag. I'm a, a medical doctor, a senior lecturer at the University of St. Andrews, the oldest Scottish university established 1413. And I've been working for Oxford, uh, teaching uh, potential medical students, high school kids for 10 years and really enjoying that that role. Um, otherwise, in St. Andrews, I've been teaching uh, future doctors for 25 years. Since 97, I've been lecturing at St. Andrews University. So over nearly close to 4000 uh, doctors passed through my hands uh, and some of them now are well-known uh, worldwide uh, professional doctors who really made a difference in, in a field of medicine. Uh, to teach in the uh, Oxford program, uh, it um, is um, in a way uh, difficult to put entire medicine in a program of two weeks. So I created a program uh, for uh, potential medical students um, uh, very much hands-on activities. So I bring a um, large amount of equipment and mannequins, and I can promise you that medicine course is going to be very practical hands-on. It will be not much huge amount of theories and uh, boring discussion. It will be really hands-on on activities. So I can mention some of them that I organized in the past. Throughout the program, there is a patient scenarios um, workshop that we're going to discuss about particular issues about patients and you'll have our uh, activities to create presentation about those patient scenarios. And around the patient scenarios, we'll have uh, practical activities. Uh, first of all, we start, for example, with the magic hand washing recommended by World Health Organization. I have magic cream they'll put on and check how good are you washing your hands, which was particularly important in the past two years in uh, 
a COVID pandemic. So I hopefully that you'll carry on, the students will carry on that habit in the future. Then we'll start with some emergency medicine. So I thought all students finishing this Oxford course should know how to perform uh, resuscitation in a, a casualty. And I'll bring some fantastic mannequins that students going to practice uh, how to resuscitate a, a casualty. In addition to that, uh, I'm going to bring instruments to measure vital signs. And I often bring some other faculty members if they're free or admin team to be a models, a helpers that uh, students uh, can see my demonstration on those skills. And then they're going to practice on each other taking vital signs, pulse, temperature, blood pressure measurement, uh, et cetera. A couple of uh, lecture I'll give as well, uh, like major killers in the world on atherosclerosis, for example, and that's a very popular. Uh, then we'll have uh, several other activities like uh, measuring uh, glucose on each other. So a little pinprick in the fingers and a test the glucose level and see how good or bad your breakfast was before the practical classes in the morning. In addition to that, uh, we have several different clinical skills examination like um, neurological examination, vascular examination, knee examination, and things go on and on. And uh, for the first time, I'm going to bring to Oxford a mobile ultrasound machine. So we're going to look at, uh, we'll see what we're going to look at, maybe neck, maybe tummy. So you'll see how magic uh, we can visualize some parts of the body, what is inside the body. So, and that's often very popular amongst the students. Also, I'll bring the ECG machine. So we'll have some faculty member uh, that we're going to record ECG and then uh, the students going to do some uh, mathematics and calculation and interpretation or clinical interpretation of the ECG. That's always very popular. Some students grasp it very quickly and the others are a bit bamboozled with that, but we're trying to make it simple and that you have idea of what's happening. Also, I bring the spirometer to measure lung function. So we'll test uh, uh, each other's um, lung capacities and um, a lot of other mannequins like looking into the eyes. I'll think of thalmoscope. So we'll look at what is inside the eyes. So a lot of things uh, I'm promising for this course. Oroscopy instruments to look at into ears, etc. So usually we end up the course with a mini medical conference. So each student will have a particular disease uh, to give us uh, little 10, 15 minutes presentations. And of course there are the prices for this. One of the highlight of the um, practice course is also vena puncture, taking blood, of course, not from each other. Mind you, I often demonstrate on one living person from the faculty, if there are any volunteers, but then the students going to practice on the fantastic mannequins that really demonstrate the blood, artificial blood coming into the tubes and just the going through the procedure. So those are some of the things that I promise uh, in this course, and it's always very popular, and the students really enjoying that course. And we have numerous times examples that uh, uh, students who completed this Oxford uh, course ended up doing medicine. And uh, I had in the past two coming to in, even into St. Andrews to my school of medicine to do the medicine or the others doing in uh, Oxford itself or elsewhere in the UK. In addition to that, I uh, wrote references several times for uh, students who completed this course uh, and wanted to continue medicine in the US. And uh, they were very successful and enrolled and uh, still studying or some of them completed a medical course. So that's all from me. Would be very happy to answer any questions if um, anyone have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think you can hear uh, from Predrag not only his mastery of the subject, but the way he brings it alive to the students. And it's true of all the people you see in those little medallion photographs, uh, people who are just brilliant at their field, but they love bringing them alive. Rob Chessel, who does banking business and markets, is actually an entrepreneur himself who has businesses in Eastern Europe and in China. 
and uses a case study method, but also has every student team develop a business plan. Um, Predreg's academic conference is typical of the courses where kids not only learn about the subject, but they master their own piece of it and make presentations or develop uh, future uh, business plans or proposals or thesis ideas, even do a little hands-on research depending on the subject. Um, these are all teachers who bring the subject alive uh, in person. They model a passion for what they do. And um, I can only tell you they're some of the most interesting people assembled anywhere. We look at Abigail Branford there, who teaches international relations to the Rhodes Scholar from South Africa who is also an international champion debater. She won global championships in debate, I think uh, once in Africa and once in uh, Europe. Uh, and I could go on about all of these teachers, but I can't stress too much the unique opportunity to work in very small groups. Our seminars have a maximum size of 15 or so, very small groups, hands-on learning uh, of a kind that really can change your life. We. The teachers all are told at the beginning of the summer, your job is to send the kids away more excited about your subject when they leave than they were when they came. And believe me, these people are absolutely brilliant at making that happen, uh, which I love. If we go to the next slide, uh, we'll see a little more, I think, about the schedule. Here's a typical day. You see the interior of a, an Oxford College quadrangle with kids just hanging out on the grass. And of course, there's that opportunity. You see the basic schedule with the major class meeting in the morning from nine till noon. That's not always in the classroom. That might actually be out on the grass or it might be on a walking trip or a project exercise or even with a mannequin somewhere in a lab um, doing for artificial blood I'm getting from Predrag. I'm not sure I'll be there for that session. Uh, we have a lunchtime when kids are free to do their lunch on their own anywhere in Oxford in small groups, do a picnic, go to a sandwich shop, go for pizza, there are a million opportunities, including little cafes and coffee shops all over the city. It's a great way to explore the place. Three afternoons a week, we have minor seminars uh, from one to three, which uh, will, means that there are three days a week, each week where you have minor class. It's a smaller introduction to your second subject, but it, as I mentioned, can be any other subject besides your major. And you'll be with a different group of students in that minor class who are equally interested there. Every hour that we're not in classes, we have activities and workshops and sports. Um, people like Abby and the team uh, who oversee a residential life lay on a rich program of cultural activities. There will be guest speakers, we'll be going to plays in the evening, sometimes outdoor productions of Shakespeare in an ancient castle or in a college garden, sometimes a great world expert in a subject who does a conversation or a presentation in the evening, sometimes a concert, sometimes a walk to a visit to a very historic part of Oxford. There are also times when students have uh, time to work on their uh, projects or to just meet some of the other kids in the programming in the program um, and talk about ideas and, and shared interests going forward. I'll say a word about the student body. I'm often asked, what are the kids like? Uh, well, the great thing is these kids are the kinds of people who, uh, who think of summer as a great opportunity to explore new ideas and new subjects. Um, and these are kids who could be anywhere. They could be on a beach or playing tennis, but they've decided they wanna to come to Oxford and do a subject like psychology or medicine or law. And so they're quite extraordinary and self-selective. The great thing about them is in general, most of the kids in the program are the only one from their school. And I'm sure Predrag will confirm that's true. They're the kinds of kids who don't need to run with the crowd. They're very happy to come for an experience like this, to meet other kids like themselves from all over North America. The excitement is that you're in a seminar with kids who are equally interested in medicine or equally interested in international relations, um, which is terrifically exciting. And, and I think kids come away with a sense that, hey, I could be in an academic environment with this, and I would love to be surrounded by other kids um, like the ones I'm in class with here. So we're happy to put you in touch with former students, but um, it's really an extraordinary and potentially life-changing 
uh, activity. And the kids who form friendships here continue to be friends as they go on to college um, in the many great colleges that they get into uh, and continue friends sometimes for, for life. Um, I'm still in touch with some kids I had more than 25 years ago in our Oxford programs. And I've had the children of former students, which dates me a lot, uh, but children, including some who are coming this summer, who are the children of students I actually had years ago. So for the right kid, there's nothing like it. I'm gonna be there with these people, Abby and Predrag and all the great faces you all saw on the screen. I really look forward to welcoming people to Oxford and, and helping to share this magical place and the people in it with all of you. Thank you, Jim. And thank you, Pedrag and Abby. That was fantastic. Uh, we're only two minutes out of line too. So we're on schedule. And we would love to take questions now. And Kiki, I think you're going to lead that. Unless Hannah, do you have anything you wish to add at this time? Or are you happy to? Well, I was going to jump in and um, just share a couple of questions that came up that maybe you could address. I think the first one um, would be for you, Professor Basker, about how do you decide between a major and a minor since they do meet for different amounts of time? Um, I get asked that all the time. And this is typical of the kind of student we get in this program where the toughest decision is how do I choose the courses? Often kids have four or five different interests. For the major, I would choose the course that you want to throw yourself into and get as much of it as you can. Um, so it may be a subject you already know that you love, like creative writing. It may be a subject like medicine that you've never done before, but you really want to immerse yourself in it. That's the way to think about it. What's the subject that you just want to get all you can? With the minor class, I would feel more comfortable there experimenting. You know, I don't know anything about psychology. I think I'll try it. And so a minor is a, is a more uh, moderate and controlled experience of any other subject. It should be something that you're curious about, um, but that's the place to experiment with something that you may never have tried or thought about trying before. Great, thank you. And the other one, Pete, this one might be for you. This is about the application process at this time of year. It is, you know, is there still time to apply and when, um, when do you stop taking applications? The answer is it's a rolling admissions process. There is right now still very limited space left in both the first and second units. Give us a call because it's really important that we can figure out whether or not we have room in your first choice major and minor. Uh, but the answer is, uh, you simply go to the website and hit apply now, fill out the application form, which will take you probably less than seven minutes, uh, list your major and minor first choice and second choice uh, for, for major and minor, and submit a $700 deposit on Visa or MasterCard. We will then immediately get back to you and hopefully say, yes, we have space. And uh, then we will ask you for the emails of two teachers or advisors that know you best at school. We'll ask you to write a short essay. We put all that together. If you're in, away we go. And if you're not, we just refund all of your money and suggest that you apply sometime in the future when you're more ready for it. It's worth mentioning around admissions that this is a really dynamic, high achieving, right group of students. It doesn't mean that this is like school, as I think Professor Basker made clear. You're learning about topics because you want to, not because you have to, no grades, no exams. Uh, uh, no finals, uh, but it's really an opportunity to learn at a level that you probably can't in high school, I would assuredly say you can, uh, about topics that you're either very curious about or really moved by or both. So it's a really dynamic group of students. And I think as Hannah and, and, and we can attest, in addition to these dynamic seminars, they're also really excited about the afternoon activities, evening activities, weekend activities, dynamic group. You're not going back to the seminar sitting in your dorm room and wondering what do you do next. There's a group meeting every day, as Jim mentioned, where all kinds of activities are planned and chosen. And it could be as diverse as from a cricket match going on, a couple of little, you know, in an area, some students are getting organized to go see that, a Shakespeare production, to Professor Basker standing up at the at evening meeting, which he often does and says, hey, in this very calm and sort of understated way, I'm gonna be leading a 
walk around this area of Oxford tonight for anyone who wants to come. I always tell students, go do that. It will be the most interesting journey you've ever been on. Uh, but oh, it might just be a coffee house where students get up and say, we need performers. We'll be in such and such a college tonight, all kinds of music, comedy, you name it, and we entertain ourselves. So there's a lot going on within the program. And my point is, if you're a curious student who really wants to engage in a great community of learning and fun, this program is for you, but get moving because space is very, very tight. Okay, thank you. Um, can the kids leave campus at dinner or evenings to explore town on their own? Let me speak to that. Um, it's hard for us to understand how different Oxford is from the American notion of a campus uh, because Oxford University is distributed throughout the town of Oxford. So each of the colleges, and there are 38 colleges in Oxford, is its own community, but no one refers to them as the campus uh, because there are also all the university buildings and shops and so on. So when you walk out the front door of your college, and we're going to be in three of them, you're in a city street. There's a coffee house next door. There's a museum 100 yards down the road. There's a park across the way. Oxford is the most beautiful and um, stimulating community. So the, the short answer is yes, students have a lot of freedom to move in and out of college. Of course, we have curfews and we have guidelines about the safe way to uh, go out in pairs around the, the town. But yes, there's a lot of freedom in the evening. Of course, in early July, um, there's light until almost 10 o'clock at night as well. So it's a beautiful time of year. In the evening, some of the great parks like Christchurch Meadows and University Parks are open for um, just hanging out on the grass and seeing the flowers. Uh, it's a beautiful place to be and kids will have, uh, within certain guidelines, a lot of freedom to explore the place. Yeah, I think it's worth mentioning or, or adding to Jim's comments. Students, you, you, we, we, we house you according to your major, as was mentioned earlier, and there's often three or four majors at a college. So you get up, you go to breakfast in these gorgeous historic dining halls. You go to your major. At lunchtime, the students want to be in town. So we take our breakfasts and our dinners you know, at our colleges, and often we do them all together at one of the colleges and we move around for dinner. But because we all want to be together, but the students really want to be together for lunch. So there's all kinds of amazing food in Oxford from you know, sushi to you name it, every food imaginable. And the students all gather there's a very safe place. Lunch is the only thing that's not included in the tuition aside from the airfare because students want to have a meal together in town before they head off to their afternoon uh, seminar. So you know, you're, you're, you're in and around, as Jim said, you cannot separate the, the town of Oxford from the university. It's really one and the same and very safe. And the faculty will help advise kids on interesting places to go. One of my favorites is St. Mary's Church, which is from the 1200s. It has a little tiny uh, graveyard right in the center of town, but it also has a buffet lunch service. So you can actually get tea or coffee or snacks or lunch and then sit in this quiet graveyard for your lunch uh, in the oldest spot in the center of town. But there are a lot of magic places like that all over the and city. I, and, and I know the secret to the best hidden little Indonesian noodle shop that you've ever had. And it's the best noodles I've had outside of Indonesia, period. So, you know, there's just so much diversity in Oxford. Great. Um, one other question about what happens on the weekend and classes that are held on Saturday morning, but what happens the rest of Saturday and on Sunday? Activities. Um, students are faced with choices every hour of the day that they are not in class. And Predreg has seen this for years that uh, typically, and we don't march around the whole program, you must do this, you must do that. There will be a choice of sports, walking tours, guest talks, a uh, tour of a bookshop, tour of the Baldwin Library, a chance to visit Christchurch Meadows. Um, there will be every hour of the afternoon and evening and all day Sunday, um, different choices. Now on Sunday, we might take a little more adventurous walk out uh, to Port Meadow, which is the oldest place in Oxford, recorded in the Domesday Book back in the Dark Ages. Uh, and go see uh, the ruins of a medieval uh, convent that is there on the Thames River. 
because we have more time to walk. Um, but lots and lots of things that are there as choices for kids to sign up and do. All right. Um, the only other question is just whether or not students can change their major or minor topics if they get there once the program has already started. Well, that's a problem. Uh, it's possible, theoretically, but you will appreciate that most of the classes will have filled um, when students enroll from here. So there will not be places to move into other classes. But also it's assumed that you choose your first choice of major or minor before you arrive. We make staffing decisions about that. We make housing assignments based on that. You'll be living in the college with your major teacher and with your major class colleagues. Um, once in a while, something exceptional happens where a student needs to change major or minor. But in general, um, we get that set before people take off. And it's my job to make sure you all have teachers who are outstanding in every subject. I promise you that will be the case. There are no duds here. It's also just worth mentioning that it's easier, assuming there's room, to switch a minor than a major for the reason that you're not living, you're not assigned to housing based on your minor. So, you know, we will help if you if you if you if you need to move a minor and we have space, we'll make it happen or try to make it happen, but majors is tough. Yeah, and there's a great team there on site to go chat with if you have any questions or concerns. So um, that is all of the questions we have for the moment. So any well, final words? Just say thank you to uh, Jim and Pedrag, Abby, Hannah for joining this webinar. Uh, it, we've been doing this a long time. I think it's worth mentioning that in 71 years, everybody's always come home alive and well, and we plan to keep it that way this summer. Um, it's a really tight community. It's an extraordinary opportunity to really expand summer into a learning experience. We've watched over the years that programs have gotten shorter and shorter as students move to technology and, and, and things go faster and faster, and we seem to cram more and more into every few weeks. Uh, you know, as I mentioned in the beginning of this webinar, in the beginning, our programs used to be 14 weeks. Now they're two or four. Please note that we encourage students to join double units of Oxford. Why? In other words, spend the month there, not two weeks there. The reason is that you spend the first week, a few days, you know, students don't know each other generally. They come from all over the country and some across the world, mostly US residents. And you know, the first couple of days, you know, you're just making it all work. By the end of the first week, it's really coming together. By the end of the second week, the magic is happening. And the last thing you want to do is say goodbye to each other. And the seminars are so interesting that if you double up, you could do two majors and two minors if you're wondering what the major and the minor is. So we give a significant discount. If you do the math, if you add up the two tuitions, it's literally like almost $3,000 discount to join both units because we really want to build a community where you are challenged and you have the time to build the relationships and do the learning that's really gonna make you grow in ways that just can't happen otherwise. So just wanna mention, double up if you can get away for the month, uh, you'll get a lot more out of it. You know, in life, you get out what you put in and this is no different. So we're, we hope you'll join us, uh, we hope you'll apply. Don't waste any time because the window is closing and uh, give us a call anytime here at Putney if you have questions or wanna dig in more deeply to any particular topic or question. Thanks so much team and uh, thank you all for joining us. Have a great night. Thanks everybody. See you in Oxford. <laughs>